Hey Crossbridge, my name is Daniel Gonzalez. This is my friend Morgan Gallion. We are so glad that you're joining us today. You know, we're getting ready to wrap up summer and we have some really great events coming up that we wanna share with you guys. And the first one is this, Navigate. And parents, this is a great resource for you guys to become disciple makers of your kids. So we're gonna give you guys some tools, some different things that you guys could use as you show your kids what it looks like to follow Jesus, to uh, walk in boldness, to share the gospel with people. So that's gonna be on August 22nd. It's a Sunday night, 5.30 to 7. We're going to have dinner, and you can find more information about that and register online. We would love to have you. Well, if you're new to Crossbridge, we're so glad that you decided to call Crossbridge home. And we have our Discover class on August 22nd from 9.15 to 10.30. You can find more information online and be sure to register for that. But this will be a great class for you to learn more about Crossbridge, ways that you can serve, our values, and to meet some of our body. So be sure to register for that as soon as possible. Yeah, today we're continuing our Jesus the Storyteller series, and Pastor Kirk's going to be sharing out of Matthew 20, talking about discipleship. So let's ask the Lord to speak to us this morning and even show us what it looks like to step into a discipleship relationship or disciple the people that God has put in our lives. Well, I'm going to read some scripture as we just prepare our hearts for what the Lord has for us today. I'm reading out of Psalm 100 and it says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness is to all generations. So we can bank on that truth today, that his steadfast love, it does endure forever. So let's lean into what he has for us in his word. Let's lean in and worship and worship him with all that we have, because he is worthy of it. Good morning, Crossbridge. Would you stand and worship with us? If you are watching online, we are so glad you are joining us. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we are here to encounter your heart. Would you come and rest over our hearts? There is a sound I love to hear. It's the sound of the Savior's robe as he walks into the room where people pray, where we hear praises he hears.
voice, sing this out, awake, awake my soul and sing, sing his praise aloud, sing his praise Exalt you, Lord. Come on, just lift your eyes to Jesus. Lift your hearts to Jesus. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You've been so, so good to me Before I took a breath Before I took a breath You breathed your life in me You have been so, so kind to me And no oh,
shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall, there's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. to prove but to freely receive freely receive come on would you do that right now just receive his mercy his grace his loving kindness faithful throughout all the generations his love knows no end his mercy is new this morning Receive that truth. Cease your striving. sit here for a few moments. His presence is with us. Jesus.
feel like that's a word for somebody right now, just to receive his peace, to truly rest, to stop striving, to receive his love right in the middle of whatever's going on in your life This feels like you're surrounded by a storm. Come on, our deliverer is here. I look around and all I see are burning buildings, barren trees. Hopelessness is starting to wreak havoc. Son of man, I know you see the deepest depth unknown to me. You have planted seeds among the ashes. Cause you rebuild, you restore all that's broken from the ruins. You redeem, and you redeem, you return all that's stolen from your children. Yeah, that's what you do. Still my anxious heart, all that's gone is never lost. And Emmanuel is here and he is faithful. So I won't let my praises stop. I'll sing it from these rubble rocks. Cause I know you are good and you are Yeah. 
Come on, church, choose your own language right now, your own words, excuse me, um, to just say thank you to God for being, for, 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 the, for that truth, that he's the one who redeems, he's the one that restores. So would you just kind of assume a posture? Yeah, you can clap, you can praise, but I want you to assume a posture, maybe close your eyes, and let's just, just choose your words to say thank you. Corporately together, let's all just, um, if you're comfortable, say it out loud. If you're not, that's okay too. But let's just tell him thank you for being a God who restores, for being a God who redeems, who for being a God who doesn't just bless your mess. No, no, he rebuilds on top of that mess. And so just say thank you. Jesus, thank you that you did not consider equality with God something to be grasped but you humbled yourself. You humbled yourself and you became a man and you came to the earth and you died on the cross for my sins, for our sins. But you didn't stop there. You ripped the veil and you came, you came alive, you came out of that grave and you ascended into heaven and right now you sit at the right hand of God the Father Almighty and you're making our enemies your footstool right now. That's what you're doing. And so we say thank you. We say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus for loving us in a way that we could not grasp, we could not understand. Even when we didn't deserve it, even when we didn't know we needed it, you did it for us so that we could be called children of God. We love you, Jesus. It's in your mighty name that we pray and we believe. Amen. Amen. We're not done praying. We want to... um, to change our posture this morning as, as I was thinking through these moments uh, uh, that uh, as we would come out of that song about ruins um, and what we need to do right now is we pray for our community. Uh, there'll be teachers that have already started but they'll, they'll continue the work this week of going back to school. Moms and dads will continue to prepare. We want to change our posture to pray, to seek God's face. Uh, to, to stand in the gap for our community. And as I was thinking about that amazing song, Ruins, God took me to the passage uh, that I think you all know pretty well, Second Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people uh, will humble themselves, will seek my face, will pray, then I'll hear their prayers, um, and, and if they'll turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear their prayers, and I'll heal their land. And one of the things I felt like God wanted us to do this morning is not so much focus on the ways in which we think he needs to heal our land, but just to do the first two things, to be obedient in humbling ourselves and praying and seeking his face. And so whether that's for you to take a seat, uh, whether that's for you to stand and hold your arms open, I'm gonna kneel. I just wanna ask you, invite you into this moment um, for us to humble ourselves and to pray for our community right now. And it's an all skate. It's a time for us all to pray together. And so if that's you drawing a circle around yourself and doing that privately, if that's you praying out loud, that's great. But I'm gonna give you a season to pray. And we wanna be praying for our community as we get ready to go back to school. I know you may not have kids that are going back to school, but your life's gonna change this week, right? Just get out and drive into traffic and your life's gonna change this week. So it's, all, it's gonna change for every one of us. If you're an empty nester, you, you can intercede better than anybody else in the room because you've walked through these steps before. And so let's change our posture, let's humble ourselves, and let's pray for our community as we get ready to go back to school. Pray for teachers, pray for principals, pray for children, pray for elementary school t- uh, kids, for middle school kids, for high school kids, for college students. We're gonna spend the next few moments praying. God, we do humble ourselves in your presence. I thank you that your word is true. You said we're two or more gathered, that your presence is here. 
And so we do humble ourselves on behalf of teachers and the children that we love so much. Um, and in the chaos of, the, of all that's happening in our world, in our country, in this state, and even in our community, all, all that's happening and all um, the ways in which men think that God needs to heal their land. No, we set that aside and we humble ourselves. We do ask for forgiveness, for, for, um, for division, and for staunchly holding on to rights and opinions without listening, without caring. We ask, Lord Jesus, that that the way in which you went to the cross would be, would be on our minds this week as we think about all those that serve um, in our community um, in the areas of education, who wake up hours before kids have to be at school and prepare lesson plans, prepare teachings that um, will instruct our kids. We, we ask this week that you would bless them. For those that don't know you, would you bless them this week um, in a way that they would cause them to come to, to, to an, into a better understanding of who you are and how much you love them? For our teachers that do know you, that are like a city on a hill that, that is a light, um, God, would you cause our light to shine brightly this week? For principals and for custodians, I was just thinking about those guys who serve, who clean up after our kids um, in so many ways um, that, uh, that they, they're... they're their actions aren't even um, ever in the spotlight. God, would you, would, you just, would you just encourage the heart of a custodian at a school this week for police officers? We do pray over parents, over, over kindergarten parents and senior parents um, on, from both ends of the spectrum. God, would you, uh, would, you just, would you just calm their hearts as they get ready to return their kids into an environment of the unknown, more, more so than we've ever, ever walked in before? And God, would you, would you, we, we pray a special blessing over these children that we love, over these students that I love. God, would you, would you shine brightly in their lives this week and next week as they walk the halls again? Would you give them words to say to their fellow classmates? Would you give them ways to pray for their fellow classmates and their teachers in such a way that you would be glorified? And God, we do, we pray for our community. We know that our land needs to be healed and so we humble ourselves and we pray and we seek your face and we say, would you show us how to, how to die to ourselves and what's appropriate, what's an appropriate response for us in every circle that we walk in. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for the cross, the place where you died uh, for our sins so that we would know you and know your love and be able to spend eternity with you. I pray if there's anybody here today that doesn't know that, would you, would you open their eyes to that today? It's in Jesus' name we pray and believe, amen. Well, my name's uh, Chris Dillashaw, and I'm the student and family pastor, and uh, I'm just delighted to be with you today. I've been out for a couple of weeks, uh, was serving uh, with some of our team in the Middle East, uh, and then took a, a season of rest, but it, man, it is just good to be in the house of the Lord with you. I want to welcome those of you who are joining us online, and, and man, uh, like I said, just get ready, because you're going to get out in some traffic probably Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and you're going to need all that Kirk's going to be teaching about today, right? Because uh, life's going to be different over, these, over the course of these next few days, but just want to encourage you to be connected and to stay connected. And the way that we do that here is through uh, our top five and this QR code. And so you can scan that QR code. You can find out all that's going on in and through our church, um, ways in which you can connect to a life group, ways in which you can get involved um, in our women's ministry and our men's ministry um, and in our student ministry. And then as your student family pastor, I just really want to encourage all the moms and dads of whether you, whether your child whether you're expecting a child or you have a senior that's about to graduate, um, anywhere on that spectrum, we have an, uh, an event, an annual event called Navigate. It's gonna be next Sunday, and I promise you, this year's Navigate is going to prepare you for all that you're going to experience this year in the chaotic nature of, of not only going back to school, but what we're gonna walk through as a community. And so I really wanna encourage you, as a mom or a dad, we, we wanna partner with you as the chief disciple makers of your children, and 
and Navigate is, um, is the atmosphere in which we all come together around uh, some tools that help us disciple our children. I'm in it with you, and I want to encourage you uh, to be at Navigate. And so um, use, the, use the information to go to the website and register. There is child care. There will be a meal. It's next Sunday night here um, at the community center. really want to encourage you to be at Navigate. Also, if you're new to Crossbridge uh, today, meet the pastors out in the front. We'll have some coffee, and you can stop by and meet the pastor. Well, today, Pastor Kirk's going to be continuing our series um, <clears throat> as we're studying the parables. And so, welcome, Pastor Kirk. I'm, I was just having fun listening to you, so I wasn't ready. I mean, it's like, well, hey, good morning to you guys. So glad you're here. Glad you're joining us online. And here comes the trusty podium. Thank you, buddy. Um, well, we're going to talk about a story today that Jesus told. Now, when, it's Matthew 20, so open your Bible to Matthew 20. If you don't have a Bible, download a Bible. Everybody ought to have a Bible. It's on your phone, for goodness sake. Just download it. I promise you, you'll get more out of it. If you do one thing to take a step closer to Jesus, let it be, it's nothing else, let it be downloading the Bible app. We're going to look at Matthew 20. When Jesus tells a story, it's different than when I tell you a story, because or any other kind of story, because a parable is Jesus revealing something that's true about the kingdom of God. It's like a piece of the puzzle. No one puzzle piece, no one parable gives you the whole picture, but when you put them together, then you step out and you go, oh, step back and you say, oh, that's, that's, what's, that's what's true about the kingdom of heaven. That's what's true about God. That's true about what God thinks. That's true about what God expects of us. This is true. He's explaining this is what's true about how God does things. That's what he's talking about. And he's also saying this is what's going to be true when the kingdom of God comes to earth and is manifested in the physical boundaries of our planet. So here's what Jesus says in Matthew 20. He's talking to a bunch of people that have crowded around him. And he said the kingdom of heaven is like, is like a landowner who, went to it, who owned a vineyard, who went into the marketplace to look for workers. He goes to the marketplace at early in the morning, it says, and he found some people there, and he said, come and work for me in my vineyard, and I'll pay you a denarius, which was the agreed-upon salary for a day's worth of work. So the workers go, and they do it. He goes back at 9 in the morning, the landowner does, and he, he sees some people standing around doing nothing. And so he says to them, hey, why don't you come to my vineyard too? Trust me, I'll pay you whatever is right. So they go. He goes back at noon and does the same thing, the landowner does. He goes back at 3 o'clock, he does the same thing. Even at 5 in the afternoon, right near the very end of the day, the landowner goes into the marketplace and he sees some folks standing around doing nothing. And he says, with a bit of incredulity, why are you standing here doing nothing all day long? Come work in my vineyard. Why have you been here? And they say, because no one came and hired us. He said, well, I am. And so they went into his vineyard. So they work. And as the day ended, the landowner calls his foreman to him. And he, he says, it's time to pay the workers. Start with the ones who came last and pay them a denarius. Then start with those. Who, then go to the ones who came at 3 o'clock and at noon and then at 9. All the way to those in the early morning and give everybody a denarius. And as the ones in the early morning saw the others who came later in the day receiving their denariuses, they thought, we're surely going to get more than that, even though that's what they'd agreed to. And they grumble about the, the landowner because he pays them the same thing, a denarius. And they even say to him... You've made those people equal to us when we worked all day long and even in the heat of the day. And the landowner will say to them, Jesus says, why do you begrudge my generosity? Didn't I give you what I told you you would get? Don't, don't let your selfishness take away from my generosity. Am I not free to do with my money whatever I desire? And then he says, Jesus says, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Now, every parable, remember, teaches us a glimpse, a perspective, a point or two about the kingdom of God. No one parable teaches everything. In fact, we sort of, to understand this, we have to understand some others that we've already talked about this summer. But three things that this parable is telling us is that God is someone who seeks us. He pursues us. 
Secondly, that he's a generous, generous God. And then third, with that cryptic last phrase that Jesus said, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And he's paying the, one, the ones who came at five o'clock the same that he promised to pay the ones who came early in the morning. He's saying God is not someone that you can put in a box. His ways are higher than your ways. His thoughts are higher than my thoughts. And we have to receive him. Our right response to God is you are God. So let's jump into this parable and look more deeply into it. Because he says that God is a landowner. When he says that God is a landowner, he doesn't mean like he owns a plot of land. He's talking about the whole earth, even the whole universe. Everything in heaven and on earth, everything in the spiritual realm, everything in the physical realm, God says, that's mine. Like I've got a truck and I've got a title to my truck and it's got my name and address printed on it. If there were a title to the earth, and Revelation 5 actually says there's there kind of is one. It's going to have God's name on it with heaven underneath it. He's the owner. A few weeks ago, I quoted a, a pastor from the 1800s named Abraham Kuyper, who said, in essence, that there's not one square inch of the whole of creation over which Jesus Christ, who is God, does not proclaim mine. Every bit of everything belongs to God. This is important because this is how God sees himself. He's like he's revealing himself. Just so you know, guys, I own everything. It's all mine. That breath you just breathed, yeah, mine. That synapse that allowed you to contemplate that thought I just said to you, yeah, mine. Colossians chapter 2 says that it is through Jesus that not only everything was made, but in him everything is held together. Which is really interesting when you think that we're made of atoms and neutrons and molecules that are spinning around at such a high rate of velocity and they're held together. How? Well, we have scientific terms from it. God says, well, me. That's what he says. He's a landowner and he's the landowner of a vineyard. Now, a vineyard, a vineyard is different than just a bear. A, 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 it's easy for you to say. A vineyard is different from a jungle. A jungle grows wild without restraint, but a vineyard is completely different. A vineyard has a designer, an architect. A vineyard is cultivated. A vineyard, a, a landowner has a plan for a vineyard. And that's one thing Jesus is telling us too, is that God has a plan. He's going somewhere with the course of the entire human history it's all going a, a certain place, a certain direction. All through the Bible, God gives us, through the apostles, the prophets, through Jesus, he gives us glimpses of what his plan is for this vineyard, which we call the earth and all of creation. But the best place to find it, in my opinion, is Revelation chapter 21. I want to read it to you so you see this is a summary of what God's plan is. He gave it to the apostle John in a prophetic a vision. And so John is writing this and he says this. He says, I heard a loud voice from the throne. He's talking about the throne in heaven. He's talking about God speaking. He says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Are you listening to me? Because this is, this is God saying, here's where history is going. Here's where I'm directing the course of every event. And we're all going to this one destination, and I will bring it to pass. They will be as God. God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. Can you let this sink in a little bit? Can you imagine a life with those characteristics? For the old order of things, the one in which we live now has passed away. Verse 5, he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write these words down, John, because they are trustworthy and true. And then he says, those who are victorious will inherit all this. And I will be their God and they will be my children. 
where's history going? What's God's plan? Is he asleep at the wheel or is he taking us someplace? He says, no, I'm taking you someplace. Like the very last word of the Bible, as you would expect, is the culmination, a summary of the culmination of all of history. And it's going to look like this. God's a landowner who owns a vineyard and he's just described what he's going to do in the vineyard and who's going to be in that vineyard with him. And Jesus, in the parable that we're looking at in Matthew 20, is telling us what God's doing about it right now. Look at verse 1 again. What, what is God doing it about it? He has gone out early in the morning to hire workers in his vineyard. He's seeking us. That's what God's doing. God is a seeker. God is a pursuer. God is going out. And in fact, Revelation chapter, I mean, Romans chapter 3 verse 9 says that there is no one righteous, not even one. No one understands. No one seeks God. Like left on our own, we go that way. God's standing right here, we go that way. God is the only one who seeks and anything that we perceive as our seeking is a response to his having sought. And God seeks constantly. He goes out in the early morning in this parable. He goes out at nine in the morning. He's seeking. He goes out at noon. He goes out at three. He goes out at five. Right up to the very end of the day, he goes out and he's seeking people. And in this passage, he says, in this parable, he's talking about he's seeking workers for his vineyard. But make no mistake, in other, cha- in other parables, he, he refers to us as sheep of his pasture. In other parables, children of his family. Here, it's workers in his vineyard. But don't mistake this. God does not have work that he needs us to do. He has work that we need. We, he doesn't need us for significance. Our own self-inflated impression of ourselves just wilts in, in front in the presence of the sovereignty of God because he doesn't need us, but he pursues us. He doesn't need us, we need him. He doesn't need us for his work, we need his work. He doesn't need us for significance or to be complete, but we need him for significance and to be complete. And he is utterly committed to this. He's, he's going, he's seeking over and over. And in this case, he talks about workers coming into his work, into his vineyard. And, and the work of God is not boredom. The work of God is not tedious. The work of God is not like nameless, faceless migrants who might come into a foreign country and then be treated like slaves and exploited. That's not it at all. The work of God, Jesus said, is to believe in the one who sent him. The work of God is to trust, that he, is to trust in Jesus. The work of God includes inheriting the kingdom of heaven. The work of God in the Beatitudes, chapter 5 of Matthew, is to receive comfort. The work of God is to receive his mercy. The work of God is to walk in the most abundant life that you possibly can. The work of God is to enjoy him. And the work of God is to do with him what God is doing. You know, when I had, when my kids were little, my three little girls, I remember once when we lived in Fort Worth, we were, I was raking leaves in the front yard, and one of the girls came out, and they were, at that point, seven, five, and three, I forget which one this was, and, and I was raking leaves, and she wanted to rake leaves as well, and so I was going to let her, so she barely is big enough to hold the rake and, and certainly not big enough to wield it with any skill at all. And she grabs it and she's moving it around. And so what do I do? I come put my big daddy arms because these are big daddy arms in our family, the biggest daddy arms in the whole Freeman family, in fact. And I put my arms around my little girl and together we rake the leaves. The work of God, when you put your hand to what God has called you to do in following him, you're going to feel his hand. When you put your strength and your effort to the things and the calling of Jesus, you're going to feel his strength. You're going to feel his effort. Philippians 2 says, he works in you to do and to desire his will. 
this work that God is calling workers to do in this parable, you got to understand, it's not about go get this done and then come report back to me. It's like, come, live your life with me. The work of God looks very much like normal living. It's just done with a different motivation. It's done with a different heart. It's done with a different power. It's done with a different level of victory. It's done with a different level of compassion and generosity and a different level of hope. Why? Because you're doing it with God. That's the work of God. We don't work alone. And God is right now in the season of seeking people, saying, hey, come work for me. Come do this with me. Or in other parables, come be a sheep in my flock. Come be a child in my family. He uses all kinds of pictures so that we'll get the message, the complete picture of what he's asking for us. So we're in a season right now as we move toward that, the fulfillment of his plan in Revelation chapter 21. We're in a season of God's seeking. But from another perspective, we're in a season of God's, of of our We're in a season of God seeking, but we're also in a season of our responding. You look in verse 2, when the landowner goes out and he sees and he looks for workers early in the morning, he agrees with them to pay them a certain wage. To agree with them means he he spoke with them and, and they complied and agreed. Yes, we want to give our lives to the work in your vineyard. In the next verse, he finds others in chapter 9, I mean, verse um, verse 4 and 5, but at 9 a.m., he says, come work in my vineyard. You're not doing anything. Come work in my vineyard, and trust me, I'll pay you what is right. And so they went. They responded. God is seeking, but we are in a season where we have got, people have to respond. Do you ever wonder, do you ever wonder while evil continues to persist in this world, I mean, if God's taken us to Revelation 21 and everything's going to be made new and there's going to be no more tears or mourning or crying or death, well, why didn't he just do it? Seems like a pretty good time for him to come. But the reason he doesn't do it is because when he comes, he is going to vanquish, destroy, remove all evil and sin from the world. Were he to come in this very moment, There are many that are still living under the curse of sin who would stand before God in judgment and they would bear the weight and the curse of their own sin. The reason he waits, the reason he defers, the reason he tarries is because he is seeking people. He wants as many people in his vineyard as will respond to him. He puts off his second coming in order that the window of opportunity can stay wide open. But make no mistake, there's a day when that that window closes. And that's why there's a sense of urgency about this parable. You know, he's seeking in the morning and at nine, at noon, at three, and at five, and then he stops seeking. It, it, the time for seeking is over and the time for payment has come. And you know, I know that m- many of you have already responded to the call of the landowner. Many of you have already said, yes, God, I want to work in your vineyard. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross and giving me new life and paying the debt. We just sang that song. But there are certainly some among those whom you love who have not responded to the landowner. God is holding the window of opportunity open for your spouse, for your children, I don't know who it is in your family, for your friends, for your extended family, for those that you love, God, your coworkers. God is holding the window of opportunity open. For those of you who've already responded to the landowner, he's holding it open yet longer For the sake of those whom you love. Because the work of the vineyard, the celebration of Revelation 21, it's not our default destination. Heaven is not our default destination. Heaven is an invitation. 
this vineyard, Revelation 21, the new earth and the promise of dwelling on earth with God is not a default for all people. It is an invitation to which we have to RSVP. If you and I were both invited to a wedding and you RSVP that you're coming and I don't, there's not going to be a seat for me at the reception. They didn't prepare a meal for me. Not because I wasn't wanted or wasn't invited, but because I did not respond. This, that, there's another parable that speaks exactly to that. But here Jesus speaks of it in terms of a vineyard. He is inviting people to come work, but, there, but if we do not come work, the payment, the harvest, the joy of that plan is not going to be ours. Do you sense any of that sense of urgency? You know, before I met, before I preached today, there's a group of us that were praying. We pray every, um, every Sunday morning at 8.30. And I was just saying, Jesus, you have to speak to the hearts of us today. Because we live in such relative comfort. We got air conditioned. We got cushioned chairs. We got cars that play music while we travel and keep us cool as we drive. We've got homes and jobs. We've got TV and everything else. And it anesthetizes us. It dulls us to the reality of the urgency of the day that God is seeking. But he will not always seek. Over the course of human history, you know, when he says the landowner went out in the early morning and then all those other times during the day, we can view that from one perspective, like from all of human history, from the beginning, the early morning of history, God shows us with Adam and Eve that he's seeking us. He wants to be with us. And as Adam and Eve went away, God comes maybe at nine in the morning and speaks to Abraham and gives him a promise. And then he, he comes at high noon when Jesus comes fulfilling all the prophecies. And then he comes through the Holy Spirit maybe at three in the afternoon. And then he's going to come again at 5 p.m. And so we could view this from the perspective of human history. I think also we can view this from the perspective of your own individual life. Like, like God has been seeking you. God seeks you when you're a child, which is why we invest so much energy in things like Navigate to help you parents take, make the most of the early morning of your child's life. God seeks you as a teenager. God seeks you as a young adult. Come Work in my vineyard. He seeks you in middle age and he seeks you to, till your very last breath. But there comes a time when he stops seeking. It's an important thing to know because when this first phase of our existence, this physical life right now, ends, the seeking is over. The opportunity to RSVP is, is done. And if we look at our lives and we measure the time of our lives in, in the day of our lives just based upon how old we are, we are missing it. We're missing it. I've officiated so many funerals and, and been within so many homes in an attempt to comfort so many families for Elderly people who lived a good full life and then went on to be with Jesus. But I've also, I've also sat with parents of 8-year-olds and 10-year-olds and 17-year-olds and 21-year-olds. And I'm not getting emotional because of what I had to walk through. That's not the deal. The deal is that God is seeking and none of us knows the time of day in our lives. And my gosh, we just walked through a pandemic and don't know what we're walking into even right now. God, God seeks you in every, in every moment of pain and hardship or heartache that you've encountered because we live in a world under the curse of sin. God has been there calling you saying, hey, come rest in me. You can find, I'm the safe place. Come be part of my family. I will not abandon you. I will not break your heart. You can count on me. In every moment of joy that you've encountered, God has been right there saying, my joy is the joy. I'm the true source of joy. 
My joy is the joy that never ends. It will always be there, even when your moment of joy in the world turns into a a moment of pain. In the created world, he's been calling you, saying, look at how everything works with precision. You wouldn't put a disassembled computer in a bag and shake it up and expect it to become a computer, would you? Nor would you expect the created order that we experience right now to have come into existence without, the, without that of a designer. Our earth perfectly positioned before the sun so that we're not burned up, nor are we frozen, but we experience the life-giving energy from it. The incredible pre- predictability of the seasons and the stars and the way the orbits of the planets work. God has been saying, I'm calling you. I'm a designer. I'm the architect behind this incredibly complex creation that you live in and take for granted because you've never experienced anything else. God is seeking you. And every time the good news of Jesus is spoken or explained like it is being done so at this very second, the landowner is calling you. And he's saying, come. Come work in my vineyard. Come be a part of what I'm doing. There is no more important decision. You know, when he goes out at 9 and at 5 in the afternoon, 9 in the morning, 5 in the afternoon in this parable, there's two, he says the same word appears twice. It's the word nothing. At 9 a.m. he goes out and he sees people standing around doing nothing. At 5 p.m. he goes out and he sees people and he says, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? There's not a person in here or alive who would think that their whole life has been characterized by doing nothing. Oh, we're busy. But it doesn't matter. This is what Jesus is saying. It doesn't matter how much wealth we have. It doesn't matter the position to which we've attained. It doesn't matter the power or the social media influence that we may think we have. It doesn't matter the possessions or the wealth that we have. If we have not responded to the landowner's invitation to be in the vineyard and to work his fields, Jesus is telling us that from God's perspective, we've been doing nothing. The God who made you, who enabled you to do everything that you are doing, the creator says, hey, at the highest level, you've been doing nothing, Kirk, if you've not responded to my call to work in my vineyard. So it makes me wonder, just makes me wonder, what is the, what time of day is it for you? What time of day is it for me? What time of, what time of day is it for the people that I care about? What time of day is it for my neighbors? I care about them. I know them. They're younger, two of them on either side. They're, they're young, you know, on different places. In my neighborhood. They're younger than me, but are they, what time of day is it for them? You know, there was a man named Luke Short who lived in the mid-1600s. And when he was 18, he heard a message from a pastor named John Flavel. And Flavel talked about another parable that spoke about the horror of dying in this, physically dying, and standing before God still under the curse of sin. But Luke heard that when he was 18 and did nothing with it. In fact, his entire life, he ignored the call of the landowner until 85 years later, when he was 103 In a moment of solitude and quietness, the Lord calls one more time for Luke Short. He reminds him of that message that Pastor John Flavel, who had already died and gone, had preached when he was 18 years old. And there, at the last call perhaps, at the end of the day, For Luke's life, he says yes. He lived three more years to be 106. And when he he died on his tombstone, 
They wrote, here lies a babe in grace aged three years, but by the natural order, 106. You know, I'd, the Lord's impressed this with, with a heaviness on my heart. Because sitting in a comforting chair, comfortable chair, like Luke Short may have done on a wooden bench back in the 1600s, and hearing some pastor talk about the Bible is not the same as responding to the landowner. It's not. These words can be, can be utterly ineffectual in your life unless you respond. And I feel a heaviness in my heart that some of you will not. That you'll potentially just use your involvement here as a, as a means of sort of tamping down the feelings of guilt that you have, that we all have. Or that it might somehow give you the appearance, or some shallow assurance that, yeah, you're good, you're all right. You look like the rest of these people. It's not about that. God, in his sovereign, amazing ability, is looking into the heart of every single person. And he knows, are you part of his flock? Are you part of his family? Are you in his vineyard? He looks in your heart. And he... And he sees you and he knows that if you are in his vineyard, in his flock, in his family, he's like, come join me because there are people that you love that are not. I'm ho he's holding back this amazing plan for the sake of people responding. And you either need to respond to him or you need to go to those who need to respond to him. But the one thing we simply cannot do is ignore it, either one of those things, one more day. You don't know what time of day it is for you or anyone else. Clay, take a moment to reflect. This may be the most important part of our time. Don't leave, don't pack. Just close your eyes for a moment. What is it that the Lord is stirring your heart to do in response to his words? Is he bringing someone's name or face to mind? Will you put your hand to that? Feel his hand holding yours as you go. Or is he stirring something in your own heart to quit playing games with him, to quit ignoring him, to quit giving him a, a slice of your life and just say, God, you can have the whole cake. In a moment, we're gonna we're gonna stand. The team, Brian and his team, are gonna lead us in another song of worship. We're gonna have a team of people that are gonna stand just in front of this stage and right on the edges. And it may be that today you just you got a prayer request, unrelated maybe to what I've been talking about, and you just need someone to pray for you in that need. This is the time for that. Could be that the Lord stirred your heart with a face or the name of a person whom you care about or you love or someone that God wants you to love. And, and you want to commit yourself to saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with God in his vineyard. I'm going to go with God into the market. And I'm going gonna, 
I'm going to make sure that somebody, this person knows his truth. In the same way that my words can't convince you, your words cannot convince another person. But when you speak the words of the good news of Jesus, there is power. He's the great convincer. Let us agree with you as you commit to going with him. You come down for prayer. And maybe God is saying, hey, you need to, I'm calling you for real. I want you to answer me for real. I want you to come be in my vineyard from now on. It doesn't matter what you've done. You may have lived 103 years and wasted them like Luke Short had in terms of God's perspective. But, but this can be the start of a new life for you. Come and tell one of our people, I'll be down there and just say, I want, I want to follow Jesus. So whichever one of those three categories of needs is you, I want you to stand with me right now. Go ahead and stand and I want our team of pastors and zone leaders, life group leaders, prayer folk, whatever, could have come down just be in the front, not so much on the sides. And as we sing, just avail yourself of the blessing of these people that want to pray for you because God is going to move in power in your life. Respond as he calls you to move. Let's worship him.
It's so important as we follow Jesus to include others in what we're doing and show them what it looks like, what that means, whether that's showing them what it looks like to have a quiet time or what it looks like to share the gospel or to pray with boldness. Let's include others and ask the Lord what that looks like for us this week. And you know, here at Crossbridge, we have a lot of great resources for you to learn and grow in that. And you can get more information on the website and social media. And one really great event we have coming up is Kindle on August 21st. And this is an event where we team up together and we partner even with some other churches in the city and go reach San Antonio with the gospel. So I would love for you to join us in that. You can register online. Well, our gathering is starting up here starting in September. And so if you're a lady of Crossbridge, this is a way, great way to get plugged into community. So whether it's Bible study or freedom groups, this would be the place for you. Yeah. And registration ends on August 29th. So you want to be sure to go on our website, find out more information and register as soon as possible. Well, Crossbridge, we love you and we'll see you next week.